Right, that's it. We're live. Right, so hello everybody and thank you for joining us tonight. I've had a few weeks off, but um, tonight I'm delighted to be joined by Bert Sheffield, who is a Canadian Paralympic dressage rider and you've been to two World Equestrian Games, is that right? And yeah. the Rio um, Paralympics. So I'll hand over to you. Could you tell us a bit more about your story, about yourself and how you got into dressage? Uh, I started riding when I was quite young. Um, I was, I think I was four or five and my best friend went for riding lessons. And although I was in a sort of horsey, sporty household, I'd, I'd been plonked on my mum's horse when I was very small, but I hadn't sort of, it, it wasn't a thing in my life. But then my best friend went for riding lessons and because I wanted to do everything, you know, we did everything together. I went to riding lessons at the riding school as well. So I started riding and then I had a bit of an accident at the riding school and my mother decided that she would rather I had my own pony. Um, so we were a bit more in control of what we did. So <laughs> she bought me a pony um, for the grand total of £200 <laughs> and away we went. And since then, I've been riding. I I was always interested in dressage. Mm -hmm. Dressage um, always was more of a fit for me than the jumping stuff because my first pony was a really good stopper. <laughs> it could take off and land back down <laughs> on the same side with its head between its knees yeah. and eject me multiple times over and over again and I was not that kid that went I'm gonna solve this I was the kid that went I don't want to do that anymore yeah <laughs> another feeling um so I I naturally gravitated towards dressage and then when I was five um because my mum's Canadian the world dressage championships were held almost at the next door farm to where my mum had been when she was in Canada. So she made me sit as a five-year-old child through <laughs> days and days and days of, you know, top-class dressage. And it was, I don't really remember it too well, but I think it must have sort of percolated through the, the grey matter somehow. Brilliant. Um, and I... I was absolutely captivated by the glamour of it all. I obviously had no idea at the time the technicality or the expense or <laughs> the, you know, all that other stuff. I was just like, oh, the glamour, the, the elegance, the beauty of it just shone through. So how did you go from uh, the pony that tipped you off at every jump to being serious about dressage then? Well, we then, when I was 11, I got another pony and that was um, to to be a dressage pony for me. But when we started working with her, it became obvious that she was not entirely suited for dressage. Um, there were hiccups in her upbringing that weren't immediately apparent. <laughs> um, so we ended up showing her. And I was showing, she was a Welsh cob, and we showed her very successfully, and I had a lovely time showing Welsh cobs and being in that environment. Um, but I always wanted to come back to the dressage. And then I had all my health problems and all, all kinds of stuff kicking off when I was a teenager. But then I, I managed to get through university, by hook or by crook, and... I didn't really know what to do with my life after that. I wanted to do something with horses. I was still had a horsey dream. I, I, I still wanted this. And I think my disability made me um, more sensitive to the fact that you sort of, you're on borrowed time. You know, the time you have to do this is is going to be limited. Your your bodily strength to do this is going to be limited. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it now. And the more you can learn while you've still got your body functioning to a degree, the more hopefully you'll be able to take in, into it through muscle memory and, um, you know, 
experience when things do start to break down even more. So after university, I went to work for Gareth Hughes yeah. as a working pupil stroke BD apprenticeship thing, which didn't quite work out as that because they hadn't formalized everything in a watertight way at that point. Um, there weren't the government systems for the apprenticeship like there are now. And it was Gareth that said to me, he used to sometimes call me Hoppy because I was lame <laughs> wandering around the yard. And he said to me, I don't understand why you don't do para. And I'd never really heard of para. Um, I kind of, I'd grown, the, the riding school I'd been to when I was a kid was an RDA riding school. Um, so I understood about riding for the disabled and that yeah. therapy side, but I had no idea about para sport particularly other than like wheelchair racing and like the obvious sort of big visible um, para sports. Yeah. So Gareth told me to go and sort this out and I did. Um, and I started my para journey while I was working for him and then I carried on and in my head, I'm still not disabled on a horse, um, but more and more people are saying to me oh yes this isn't quite working quite right now is it yeah. <laughs> it's all there's a there's a dissonance between what my brain thinks and what my body does oh. <laughs> so when when did um it look like a an olympic games might be a possibility then how did that come about um well i decided that i wanted canada as my sporting nationality because i'm a dual national so back in 2012, I spoke to the Canadian team people to find out what it would take to be considered for Canada and how it all works, because there is such a huge difference between um, being like a national rider mm -hmm. and being an international rider and, you know, aspiring towards games and stuff. So I, I went and explored that and they said they'd be quite keen to have me and help me on that pathway. So I I kind of, I never felt like, I think because I came from a very sporty family, my father's won numerous world championships as a skeet shooter. As a so, skeet shooter? What, what is that? That's what that is. <laughs> um, that's blowing holes in the sky with a shotgun. Oh. <laughs> um, but it was, for me, I never saw like Olympic athletes as anything but people. Yeah. So the idea that I could go to a Paralympics was not like, never felt like this unattainable sort of godlike thing. It just, it was sort of like, yeah, well, if you're good enough, you get picked and you go. Isn't that how it works? <laughs> you know? well, do you think there's something about the way you were raised then in that kind of environment that sort yeah. of developed that mentality? What What do you think your mum and dad sort of did differently? Well, I think it was just that exposure to high level sport. And there was never any bars to what you could achieve other than sort of, when you ran out of talent, if you if you're in a talent, you know, if you believe in talent and sport, um, or if you ran out of money or you ran out of resources, um, it was always that very sort of enabled mindset of, well, top athletes are just people. They yeah. eat and they sleep and, you know, they do other things. Um, yeah. It's you know, they're not superhuman. They're just they're just people, and you're just a person. So, you know, the road is there. You just have to go and find it. You know. So, what did the journey to Rio look like then? What was that road like? <laughs> well, I had a really nice international horse as my first international horse. Um, I'd had him when he was four, but it became clear that he didn't have enough soundness quite early on. I think he was five when he first broke. Um, and I mean, he's an oddly conformed creature, but yeah. he's amazingly talented. Um, and I, I found a picture of a foal online and I fell in love with this foal 
and she belonged to a friend of mine, bred her. And I'd said, you know, can I buy it? And she said, no, 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 you can't buy her. She's been, she's been sold. And then when she was two years old, um, Susie phoned me and said, your horse is still sat in the field. <laughs> Are you going to buy it or what? Because, you know, you know, it's still there if you want it. So I, I bought her on MasterCard over the phone <laughs> and we, we you know, came and collected her. And so when she was two, she came to me and I trained her and she ended up being the horse I took to the Rio Paralympics. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So she went, she was, um, she is an amazing horse. Um, she was very lucky because she tootled along in the background behind this other horse while she was doing her development and she ended up she was my reserve horse for the 2014 world equestrian games right um when she was six i think at the time she was six or seven she was seven i think uh, so she was only nine when she went to rio but she was yeah. an amazing horse she's now with a young rider who bought her from mm -hmm. me after rio but we've um yeah the journey was yeah, it, it's never straightforward. There's always things that happen and curveballs. And it's so nice when you have that depth of knowledge of the horse when you've had it for so long and there's so much partnership there. Yeah. Yeah. Makes so sense. the actual competition didn't quite go to plan either, did it? Read in your website. Tell us. Uh, no, no. The problem, <laughs> it, the, uh, the competition was not not how you would have wanted it to go um darcy is really sensitive in her skin um and she um yeah she had a kind of allergic reaction -y thing to something in the stables and so it was a massive veterinary and groom and everything effort just a huge team effort to get her even down the center line because she was sort of, she wasn't really having nosebleeds as so much as where she'd sort of got blistering inside her sort of respiratory system from whatever had caused this hmm. sort of allergy. She was sort of dripping serum -y stuff, yeah. which with her white nose looked... Oh. Yeah, if, if she'd had dark skin, you probably would have just thought, oh, she's got a slightly drippy nose. But because yeah. she had a white, you know, white pinky skin, you went, oh, yes, there's there's a problem. And I mean, she was such a soldier because she was still willing to go oh. and still putting herself out for me, even though she must have felt horrendous. Oh. Um, I don't know how much of it was the atmosphere lifting her or whether it was the team, you know, the electricity in the team that was lifting her, but she still did her best, even though I couldn't warm her up. Yeah. I couldn't do anything that was going to increase her blood pressure or um, increase her breathing or anything because it was just blowing the membranes out inside her nose. So I was warming her up in walk very quietly in the indoor arena at Deodora. And we had gunshots going off over the top of the arena. No. Um, it, yeah, it was quite, quite tense sort of reaction. And then we were taking her to the, the misting fans that you're meant to use after your test. You're meant to do your test and when you're all hot and sweaty and everything, go to the misting fans to cool yeah. down. And we were standing her in the misting fans to try and reduce her heart rate and keep everything as calm and settled as we could. And then taking her in and doing the most important tests of her life <laughs> with her basically cold, in mentally and physically cold. Well, how did you maintain your focus throughout that then? Um, almost the more adversity there is, the easier it is to keep your focus. Right. Tell us yeah. more about that. Well, when everything is going smoothly, then you're you're being tested in a different way. Mm -hmm. When you're handling all sorts of different things that are being thrown at you from the sides, you have to find a depth in yourself that you that you possibly wouldn't dig to if everything was going smoothly. 
Right. The tunnel has to be made of concrete, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, if your tunnel vision is usually sort of like the inside of a kitchen roll tube, you know, the, the tunnel has to become concrete to deal with it. You just got to get your head down, focus on your job and do it. There's no room for you to be nervous or anxious. You just it's just not there. <laughs> there isn't a headspace. You can you can sort of plan for things going wrong, can't you? But you couldn't have imagined a situation like that, could you? No, so, no, no. You'd never go. Oh, yes, my horse is going to be allergic to the bedding or whatever. Um, I mean, you will never know what was causing it. No, but do you think did do you build an element in to your training about building resilience and sort of dealing with things like that? Or did you just pull it off in the spur of the moment? <laughs> um, I've always been fairly resilient, but I quite like pressure in that way. I'm not going to set out to find pressure in that way. You know, I'm not going to go looking for trouble. Yeah. But it it's quite... Yeah, I mean, dressage is usually not a flying by the seat of your pants kind of sport. No. <laughs> um, but being in that situation, it's it's just part of the game. And I love it when I'm under pressure and I can rise to it. So how did you do in the end when you finally went in with no warm-up? Oh, I think first day we were 10th, something like that. I can't remember. To be yeah. fair, I was so stressed that mm -hmm. I didn't hear my score. I couldn't tell you what my score was. I don't honestly know what my placing was. <laughs> I was, because um, you get sort of, you come out of the the field of play, you go straight into the stewarding area where they do all the tack check to make sure there's no blood on your spurs or you're using the correct tack and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then you're let out of that and you're herded straight into the press area. Oh, no. So I was in the press area um, waiting to see if I had a score, um, half convinced that the stewards were going to say, no, no, she's eliminated, you know, the horse isn't okay. Yeah. And I have, you know, and it's just this complete whirlwind of stress because they get you in and out and through, you know, there's no yeah. hanging around. Oh. <laughs> so I, I was like, Am I going to get a score? Am I going to be eliminated? Oh, you know, I didn't even have time to check whether or not the horse's nose was okay, whether she was, she seemed to be breathing all right. You know, the judges didn't bell me. Um, <laughs> she seemed to be breathing all right. She seemed okay when I left her. Um, my groom's got hold of her now. The vet team are with her. You know, we've done our job. I, you know, at that point, and then I've got a camera in my face saying, how do you feel about your... You're right today. It's like, yeah, no, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what I feel about my ride today. Yeah, I haven't digested it yet. <laughs> no, I'm still alive. Yeah. We're both um, still alive. It's all okay. good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it's a, it's one of those experiences where you, you just don't take it all in. Um, mm. It's incredible. The teamwork involved is just incredible. Amazing. So tell us about the wonky horse then. Who's the wonky horse? Tell us that story. Wonky is a horse I bought back in 2015. And I had got a little bit disillusioned with Top Sport. I'd come back from a tour with the Canadian team around Europe with Darcy. And I was exhausted. The horse was exhausted. I was totally chewed up. Yeah. And I thought, I need a new project. I need a different project. I need something to get my passion back. I need something that's going to basically save me mentally, emotionally. And that's my dog, by the way. If you're yeah. sneezing and whinging in the background, that's my dog. And, um, yeah, I... I never have any money. I always buy my horses as cheap as I possibly can and, you know, find them from, you know, the back of the sofa kind of thing. And I saw an advert in Horse and Hound for some Frisian Cross um, Dutch horses. And I phoned them up and they said, yes, yeah, we've got about 120 horses here. Come and have a look. <laughs> Goodness. 
what they didn't realize was they really had got about 120 horses and most of them hadn't had a head collar on oh, goodness. most of them were gelderlander cross dutch warm blood um they're all driving bread they were all pretty uh feral <laughs> they were, um and it was a case of walking onto this sort of massive sort of heathland thing field thing and sort of watch and choose a horse as it <laughs> runs around somewhere you know somewhere between here and the horizon is a horse you know you decide which ones you want and we'll herd them into the yard and we'll try and separate it out and you know <laughs> hand it to you and you can do what you like with it so mm. i i chose wonky i also chose another one who um now belongs to my yard owner um and wonky had no name we didn't really know how old she was she was just one of the herd um she was just one of the mares he doesn't this guy doesn't drive the mares so the mares are a little bit surplus to requirements right um either they get bred from or they get sold or whatever so i got her she was very cheap and um yeah we we went from there it was i got a home i didn't have a stable for her so i took her to a friend's and by which point it was dark she had never had a head collar on before okay. she had never been tied up before and she was in my lorry and we got to my friend's yard who i hadn't really appreciated at the time there were no fencing around her yard or <laughs> anything like that so we're trying to unload this semi-feral horse in the middle of nowhere under spotlights like floodlights <laughs> who is terrified of the floodlights is terrified of the dark is terrified of the lorry is terrified of everything and she was this tiny curled up little spider of a creature in the corner back corner of my lorry and she decided that the lorry was safe she wasn't coming out she oh. was not gonna come out the lorry it was about half past nine at night and she was not coming out um so jess went and got one of her event horses and came and stood that at the bottom of the ramp well, that terrified her because she's obviously never seen a horse with a rug on before. <laughs> so it took quite a while to convince her to get out of the lorry. Um, and then when she came out the lorry, we had to convince her to get in a stable. Um, because we knew if you turned this out in the field, we were never going to catch it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then Jess did some work with her because um, Jess is about sort of an hour's drive from me. So... Jess did some work with her, which was fantastic, and got her going for me. And then I had her back um, a few months later. And this was always something about her that sort of inspired me. Now, whether it's the underdog thing or whether it's purely her energy, I don't know. But she's very special. Oh, and where did the name Wonky come from? Well, Jess called her Wonky because she had no name and all you could see from the corn back corner of the lorry was this sort of bizarre, irregular blaze that looked like it fell off the side of her head, <laughs> staring out at you. So she got called wonky and just thought it would be amusing if I had to go in the ring as Bert Sheffield riding wonky. <laughs> um, but wonky's actual proper registered FEI name is Farusa. Okay, so you're not hoppy and wonky, and when you no, were we're not hoppy and wonky. No, <laughs> that, that would have been a bit too much. Yeah. <laughs> brilliant. So, what what's the most important thing you've learned through your journey with horses so far? Then? I think it probably is resilience and finding inner strength and finding that um, that self confidence that you're more bulletproof. You know, when you're faced with a problem with a horse, you don't have a choice other than being bulletproof. You have to put yourself aside and you have to get on with it. And yeah. um, learning to channel your worries and your anxiety and your energy and all that um, potentially negative stuff into a problem-solving mindset where 
well, you have to sort it. You you have no option. There there is no choice, but you've got to make an outcome out of it. And the horses cre- teach you that all the time, don't they? Every every interaction you have with a horse, yeah. you you have to choose how how you um, behave in that situation, how you allow your mind to operate in that situation. So you you are learning a self-discipline a mental discipline all the time which gives you gives you a strength and a self-confidence from inside yeah we don't all manage to control those negative thoughts though and those anxieties so what what is it that you think how is it you think you've managed to do that i think it's practice yeah i i think it's practicing um you're building up layers to that shell you have to keep if you're constantly exposed to something to the point where it breaks you you'll never build it up but if you are able to experience situations where you achieve discipline Mm. in your mind and achieve a positive mindset over and over again you can develop those skills and i'm looking for that all the time when i'm around the horses i'm looking for how can i how can i handle this better mm. did i handle that right is right ever like a thing or is it optimal yeah yeah um it's like that thing of a lot of people think the dressage is about being perfect but dressage is not about being perfect dressage is about being excellent yeah so you allow yourself the slack so that you can make the mistake and grow from it not beat yourself up for making a mistake and if you've got the confidence that making a mistake is okay and it can be a positive thing then you'll grow and you'll get stronger. Yeah. I think so many people are scared of failing, aren't they, and making a mistake. But actually daring to do that is really powerful, like you say, and learning from it. Yeah, and make mistakes all the time. But it's how you handle the mistakes, isn't it? It's yeah. it's whether or not the mistakes beat you or whether or not you can um, use them as a positive thing. Mm. And, I mean, they are just experiments. I mean, the whole time we're around a horse, it's an experiment, isn't it? And it's a totally unnatural thing in many ways to do, training horses, riding horses, managing horses. Yeah, so, and I think if I lived to be a 1,000 years old, I still wouldn't have figured it out. <laughs> absolutely, no. I mean, it's that whole thing of, like, one lifetime is never enough, is it? No. Um, it's really... You know, we're learning the whole time and you learn by experimenting as well as by digesting knowledge, don't you? And you take things that you learn and then by experimenting with that knowledge, you get deeper knowledge of it. Yeah. And you accept, if you can accept that things won't work every time or most of the time, then you can allow yourself to progress rather than trying to force progress. Yeah. And if you can accept that you're going to fail, you'll dare to be more experimental as well. Absolutely. And And so often there's people we look at that we think, oh, wow, they were always successful. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they burst onto the the scene as this sort of power, you know, sort of personality. And actually you don't realise that there's thousands and thousands and thousands of hours and experiments and um, just... There's so much more behind it that you didn't notice was going on before yeah. they appear as this sort of bright burning star. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so how much do you think your um, your health issues um, as a as a youngster sort of help develop that resilience and um, building that that desire to? Mm. Pers- well, when I was. I was 14, I think I was, and I, I developed epilepsy. And then shortly after that, I developed rheumatoid arthritis. 
And then from there, my mental health completely kind of collapsed into this sort of mire of depression, eating disorders, self-harm, all that good stuff. And you do learn so much about yourself by going through adversity. Mm. And being diagnosed with a chronic disease that is... I mean, the pain can get a little bit better, but the damage that's done to your body, unless they actually give you new joints, is never going to be healed. Mm. So you know that pretty much most of the time it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Um, you, you kind of go through a grief state. Mm. I certainly know I went through a very dark, very a grieving state for I'd been at school very, very bright. Um, I'd been top of my class and I went from my men, my, um, my brain let me down. It decided to blow holes in itself with the epilepsy. And then my body let me down in fairly short succession. So I went from a highly functioning, academically gifted kid to one that was suddenly felt like their brain was not there anymore and their body was not there. So it was hugely difficult. But when you build yourself from the ground up again, yeah, yeah, I don't know whether you fill in the holes or whether or not you build stronger foundations or what analogy it is, but you you kind of have choices to make as you go, don't you? Mm. you know, how do I want this to be? Yeah. And do you have any advice to people f f facing similar challenges, either with the health or circumstances? Um, I think everybody's journey is so very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very important that you are allowed the space, the mental space, to find how the journey is going to be for you. You can't take someone else's journey and try and emulate it. Mm -hmm. You've, you need to find a self-acceptance, and that can't be put on you. You have to find that yourself, and you just need to be supported. You need to try and find what support you can for whatever stage of your recovery or you're just living with it situation you are. Because mm. it's that whole thing of no one can help you until you're ready to help yourself. But people can support you mm -hmm. even when you're not ready to help yourself. Yeah. So how did your parents support you through that then? Um, it, was, it was a challenge because it's very hard to sort of know how much is teenager brattiness <laughs> and how much is mental illness and how much is just the response to physical illness and having screwed up blood and having all sorts of you know effects of the various medications and things. You know, steroids don't make anybody um, particularly easy to live with, I don't think. Um, and living on lots of steroids and lots of nasty drugs to control the various different conditions were, you know, it, it's very difficult to sort of work out. And I think for parents, it's very hard because they're seeing, um, they're seeing somebody that they, they love change. Um, and accepting that change um, and seeing how that change is different from maybe their friends' teenagers. Yeah. Or the changes that they would have um, wanted for their teenager. You know, I'm sure all parents have a, a path that they would love to see their child go through, you know, a you know, to grow into being happy, um, you know, 
happy, well balanced, high achieving, you know, all those good things, kind of adolescence. Um, and then to see your child in hospital and not coping is incredibly hard for a parent. I can't, I can't imagine. So how important were the horses for you at that time for helping well, you through? I, one of the big problems was um, I tried riding while I had the epilepsy and it was out of control. Right. And that was incredibly scary. It is a very scary thing riding a horse and finding you are somewhere different to where you thought you were. Right. Because you've suffered some form of fit um, while cantering. Oh, goodness. In an arena with the horses mm. or, you know, that kind of situation. It's really hard um, to enjoy it. Um, and there's a frustration as well because you know that this should be doable, but it, it it's, you know, it's things out of your control that are highly personal aren't working. Mm -hmm. So I actually moved away from the horses and I came back to them um, sort of through uni. It was sort of my last years of uni. I came back into the horses mm -hmm. um, because it was just too much. Everything was just too much. Mm. Yeah. Body, mind, adolescence, school. So what, what gave you the push to come back to horses then? Um. I bought, for some crazy reason, I bought a sort of three-hour-old foal. <laughs> um, it would be May the 1st, 20, um, 2000. May the 1st, 2000, I bought him. Um, he was at a friend's farm, and we went to see the foals. I don't know why I'd gone to see the foals. I just did. And he came over to the pickup truck and went, what the hell are you doing in my field? <laughs> I've just been born. This is my field. I am king. <laughs> I am a bit small. Yeah, I'm too small. I'm a maiden mare's foal. <laughs> but I'm cocky as hell. And he came out and I bought him. <laughs> and so he was kind of stored in the field and doing all sorts of other things while I was at uni Brilliant. and we still have him oh <laughs> um he's just had his 21st birthday oh. um and he has been looking after any baby horses we have any broodmares that need anything looking after he's been out in the field for years now um <laughs> as a sort of we don't call him a field ornament because he's granddad and he looks after everybody else he has a job for you as well. <laughs> yeah. He has. He's a very special, very special little orange horse. Oh, oh lovely. <laughs> so um, what frustrates you when you're training then and how do you deal with that? Oh, what frustrates me is when I realise I can't do something I used to be able to do. <laughs> <laughs> that happens to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I have major problems with um, mobility in my back these days and I find it a real struggle to ride canter how I would want to ride canter um, and I can feel it in wonky that her hind leg reach is not what I want it to be because my basically my pelvic range is blocking her pelvic range mm -hmm. and that is intensely aggravating so how do you deal with that frustration then stand up <laughs> <laughs> stand up and luckily for para i don't have to do counter um i'm grade three so we don't counter in our tests right um but for able-bodied i just have to suck it up mm -hmm. um and when i'm training you know it, horses have to be trained in three paces you know you You've got to go through the range. Yeah. At times we don't counter every ride, but we have to go through the range at mm -hmm. times. So I have to just suck it up and I know it's gonna hurt. And I stand up if it makes it easier. And and just 
it's aggravating. I tend to be someone that gets aggravated rather than woe is me. <laughs> yeah. Frustrated, aggravated and angry at myself and the situation rather than sort of crying myself to sleep. Yeah. Um, Just find ways around it. Absolutely. Um, so who have been your biggest role models then and why? Oh, I, I saw this question on the sheet. Um, I'm not very good with role models. I'm really, really not very good with them. Um, I'm not very good with heroes. Mm -hmm. um, it just... I, I want my journey. <laughs> I'm inspired by my journey and I'm inspired by where I want to go, not... Yeah by watching other people's journeys. Yeah, well, that's really interesting because I think so many of us, particularly with social media and stuff, compare ourselves to other people all the time. Um, and it's 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 really damaging. So if you can keep your focus just on you and your journey, that's quite unique, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, I'm inspired by what I want to achieve. I'm not, I mean, other people have amazing journeys. Um, but you'll never know what someone's journey really is. Yeah. I mean, they can write an autobiography, they can write books on how they train their horses, they can do YouTube, they can do whatever. And I'm not saying that they're fake, but you're never going to get the whole picture. You're never going to get someone's complete experience. And a journey is about that immersive thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, it's you know it's not just a sugar-coated dream fantasy it's you know there's so much more to it and enjoying the depth of your own journey is is the bit that i really you know i find inspiring it's like there's so many shades to it isn't there? there's so many colors to a journey yeah there is um yeah, and I think I was, on one of the podcasts I was talking about highs and lows, you know, there's so many highs and so many lows. And, and and she said, oh, yeah, but if you just turn it the other way around and turn it on its side, you realise it's just a windy path. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it is a windy path. Um, and each, um, each twist is – each twist teaches you stuff yeah um i look at it as like it's a journey for experience and learning rather than a journey for success yeah yeah i want to learn i don't just want success that someone else has pinned the gold star on yeah exactly um yeah mm. it's it's all about the experience isn't it yeah, you can't be disappointed if that's the aim, can you then? Because there's always experience <laughs> in every situation. <laughs> as long as you give it your best, you know, you you you're giving it your best chances, aren't you? You you try if you honestly can like put you know think to yourself at the end of the day, I've done the best I could do today with the information and the resources I have. Mm -hmm. You can't regret what you've done um, because you do. You make the best choices you can with the information you've got at the time. Yeah, exactly. From the place you are at the time. Exactly. That's it. And we're all at different stages. Absolutely. So are there any resources then that have helped you? Any particular books you like or DVDs that have been inspired? Oh, there's – I am a real, like, theory – nerd junkie <laughs> me too <laughs> i love the theory of training mm -hmm. i love learning theory i love going through the classical books mm -hmm. um i like the modern um like reinterpretation of those books where yeah. people have re-examined them it's really interesting I also have a real thing about the old sort of military handbooks on how to manage horses <laughs> in the cavalry because horses haven't fundamentally changed that much. Yeah. And they had to look after their horses. They were a very valuable commodity for their everyday life in a way that a horse isn't 
mm-hmm. now. You know, yeah. it's, um, so how they looked after their horses was, it was really interesting. Um, I, I find it, I find it's just very, very interesting. Um, I particularly like the work of Gerd Hirschman. Yeah. He is an incredible um, sort of veterinary person. I've also trained with him. He is an incredible trainer. Um, he's a beautiful rider. Um, and it's... I... You know, it, it gives you, when you understand the theory, you're able to work your journey within a framework. Yeah. Um, you start, it's it's not constricting you, it actually gives you a structure to, to develop yourself along. Yeah, to problem solve and to ask better questions. Absolutely. Yeah. And everybody is developing their own system Mm, because we're all different and we all have a slightly different flavor to our training so you and i would we could read the same book and take totally different things from it yeah exactly it's the same words um same punctuation but it'll mean different things to us depending on where we are on our journey our life experience that is that we plug into it's just fascinating how you can just keep keep going back to resources and keep seeing them again and again and getting a different story yeah. from them yeah exactly particularly if you've not read a certain book for a few years and you go back to it and you're like oh my goodness i wasn't ready for that message three years yeah. ago i didn't get it then but i do now <laughs> yeah. so it always fascinates me and it it fascinates me how you can read it at the time and go yep yeah, okay i've got that yeah. And then you come back to it and you think, I haven't got it at all. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and you think, gosh, you know, in 10 years' time, if I read this again, I'll probably think I haven't got it twice. Yeah. Or three times. So, you know, the layers. That's it. The layers of meaning that the masters put in their texts is just mm-hmm. mind blowing. And like you say, that is the satisfaction, isn't it? That's the satisfaction for me. You know, I don't aspire to ever thinking I'll get to the Olympics anymore. I used to do when I was little, but <laughs> but for me, every day, it's if, if you're learning and progressing, that's the that's the satisfaction. Well, yeah. you know, it's your own Olympics, isn't it? Every time you go and ride in the arena, yeah, in a twenty by forty or twenty by sixty arena on the sand. It's exactly the same as riding at the Olympics. Yeah, it is. And you can pick one thing, like picking mm. up the Erlin's feet. I want to get an Olympic gold medal today, picking up feet, you know, and you can be that focused on that one specific task and doing it to the best of your abilities, can't you? Yeah. So. And being the best um, person that I can be for that horse that day. Yeah, exactly. Is... I mean, that's got to be so much more fulfilling than having someone else pinning a rosette on you, surely. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, definitely. What a lovely thought to finish with. <laughs> so, uh, oh, my two big questions. I think we've covered this quite a lot, though. But how do you believe in yourself and your horses? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? I don't know. When I read this, I was going, I don't know. Um, I... I believe that um, I don't really know what believing in yourself or your horse is. I believe I have an amazing horse for me in Wonky. Mm -hmm. She and I gel really well. We have a really good relationship. She's, She's a great horse for me in sport, but she's also a great horse for me from a more personal relationship partnership Mm. point of view she is such a wonderful complement to my temperament and I think I can compliment hers and the two of us are able to support each other really well but I think because I don't believe I don't believe talent is that important 
Right. It's not that difficult to believe that things are achievable. And that goes back again to what we said, I suppose, about the process and every day just turning up and being the best that you can be for your horse on that day. Yeah. It's very much process driven. Mm. Well, you know, it's, there's no point having talent if you aren't dedicated and determined. Yeah. And the same thing is you can, if you work hard, you can make up for lack of talent. Yeah. That's what I keep hoping for. <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, in how much there's not an awful lot to do with horse riding that is physically talented, um, driven, is there? No. I mean, it's not like something like swimming, where having <laughs> sort of the physique of Michael Phelps really helps. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, something where, or being a jockey where you need to be really small. Um, you know, physically, riders come in all shapes and sizes. It's, it's the mental game that's so important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what are your goals for this year and beyond then? Well, I'm hoping that Wonky and I will be selected for the Canadian team for the Rio Paralympics. We're working really hard towards that. We won't know about that until sort of July time. Um, and then we're looking towards the World Championships, which are in Herning in Denmark, um, 2022. Right. Very good. Um, Will it go ahead then this year, Tokyo? Are they still planning on it going ahead? Oh. Um, <laughs> the million dollar question. Um, I don't watch the news, sorry. Um, <laughs> at the moment, they're pretty sure it's going to go ahead. Um, yeah. I've got conference calls tonight about um, the planning for yeah. it. Um, yeah, planning. All you can do is plan that it's going ahead, mitigate circumstances, um put in all the safeguards you possibly can yeah um and if it doesn't happen then we'll have amazing um emergency planning sort of practice <laughs> <laughs> our, our our pandemic mitigation um game will be absolutely hot yeah. um and if it does go ahead we'll be prepared brilliant super um, well it's been a pleasure talking to you. We'll keep our fingers crossed for you in uh, that it does go ahead and that you get selected. And I'll be uh, I'll be watching on Facebook, so to see how you get on. And um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Louise. <laughs> All right. See you again. See you. Thank later. you very much. Bye.